All right. Welcome everyone to today's training. We're um, we're on Ignite session two. Session two is uh, probably one of uh, I think the first one is is important, right? It's about getting your mind wrapped around what we're expecting in real estate. Um, this one I, I'd say is the one to go back to often um, and, and frequent this session, and you'll see why here. This is today's class is all about building the business. Um, and the reason why I want you to constantly understand that you, you need to probably go back to this one is because when you start to build your business, your business changes over time and you're constantly building. And some of these principles hold true with every step of the, of the process, every step of your business that grows and develops. Um, you kind of have to, you want to build it based upon some of the things that we're going to go over today. All right. Um, don't know if there's too many of you guys on that was on last time, but right now is when we, we're going to go through. And if you're going to constantly come on to this with us, I want you guys to understand that this is a, this is a training, this is a class, but this is, this is similar to bold, right? As you go throughout these weeks, I want you to practice some of these principles and bring it back to our group. So before we get started uh, into the meat of what we're going to talk about today, Anybody on this call that was here or on last week when we went through the, the daily 10-4, we set our action items for the week. Um, can I want people to share right now. I guess I'll stop share real quick. Maria, were you on last week? Yeah. What uh, did you set yourself up for um, as far as your action items for last week go? Oh, um. Derek, do you remember what she said? I don't remember. All right, no, this is a good example. I'm not going to pick on you, Maria. This is no, this go is ahead. What, no, it, it's not. It's not a pick, right? It, it's it's <laughs> it's we're self we're self employed. We are self directed. We're self guided, and if we don't have a direction or a guideline or a path that we're going to go on, it's it's really going to be hard to continue to go week after week after week after week and 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 be able to quantify. Am I doing this right or if I, am I doing this wrong, right? And so each week, each day, we set out, um, you know, our to-dos, our action items, if you will. Um, Derek's action item last week was he was going to commit to 10 contacts a day with one database entry from those 10 contacts. That's his goal for himself each and every day. Um, yesterday, he ended up getting two database ads uh, to four contacts. So is that a win? It's it's really it's it's really the only person that can really truly answer that question is Derek, right? The goal was ten to one, but he did four to two. He might have gotten some more contacts. I'm just going by the example of what he and I were doing. Is that a win? It's going to be up to Derek and how he quantifies it. I think you could argue that it's not a win because he is new newer working on getting his contact um his contact count up uh for each day so you could argue that that wouldn't be a win for him but then you could argue that it is because his goal was one database ad right so if you ask the question would you rather sell 50 homes to make a hundred thousand or sell 10 homes to make a hundred thousand what would your response be Right. So in my world, he almost doubled his goal of the database side and didn't hit his contact goal. So what I'm getting at, you guys, is this is the conversation I want you guys to have in your head with your actions, with your activities. Right. Derek needs to decide whether that was a win or not. And then he needs to decide if that was a win, that his main focus is then database entry or database ads. If he doesn't feel like that was a win, then he's going to push for those 10 contacts. Right. And see, it's not right or wrong. It's what do we believe in and does 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 what we believe in move us and advance us forward. So right now we got a lot of people on this call. I, I want you guys to take maybe 30 seconds and I want you guys to write down, shut it in the in the chat box, write it on your, your, your notepad. I don't care where. But you guys got to put down your action items for each week. Right. If you have it in front of you, if it's on your to do list, it's it's that master thing. Right. And the only way to build your, this, we're going to talk about this a lot today, 
it literally will say somewhere in here um, that the numbers just don't lie, right? But if we're not tracking, we don't really know what our numbers are. We don't really know what we should be tracking. We don't know how or what is success or if they are lying, right? And so have those things down. What is the tool that we use to set forth our action items for the week? Erica Casey, you're a big proponent of this. Well, I don't know if you're a big proponent, but we have gone over yours. What is that thing called? Oh, well, you call it different. I call it my 411 yeah. action goal. Yeah. So that uh, 411, let's just take a brief couple of seconds to look at that, okay? I don't, I don't go over this a ton because the 411 is a very simple concept that we should be using, whether or not we're using the actual form 411 or we're just going through our week and setting ourselves up for success throughout our weeks, right? So let's take a look at a 411 here. I bet you yours is going to come up. Yep. It, I don't know why. Yours comes up every single time I use it as an example. Nice. And look, I added in everything from your training on Monday for my expenses. I saw that. I was in here yesterday showing somebody else. That's awesome. It's just so it's there. I think I need to move it to a spreadsheet, but I won't forget about it right here. <laughs> well, and that's, and that's also why I'm so glad that this comes up for me for an example. So this is a 411 and Erica has tweaked it, right? This is her business. Just like just like Derek is defining whether or not that was a success to him or not a success to him, that's his prerogative. Erica, I love this. On her 411, she actually puts her 135 in. So every single time she pulls out her 411, she sees her year plan. That's what this is. So typically a 411 is defined as basically what is your annual goal and you just list out that goal. She lists out the strategies and priorities around how she's going to hit that goal. I love that. Keeping your plan top of mind helps you stay away from shiny objects. I, this is not, a, this is not a, a dig against Rich's class by any means, but there are people that should not be going to Rich's expired and withdrawn class. Why do I say that, Erica? Because it's not my priority for my business and I have yeah. to like focus on what I, works for me. Exactly. Right. And, and Erica, it, it, she's been with us for a year or two now and she's had to go through that. Right. A lot of us take a lot of classes that we find to, we, we, we think sound very profound. We think sound very good, but the reality is, is if we're never going to do that action or item, if it's not on our plan, um, why spend the time and waste and wasted effort to do that, right? Erica, what are you going to do today after this class? After, after this Ignite, right? We end at 11. Rich's class starts at 11. What are you going to do with those hours? Uh, I have 50 sync calls because I didn't do yesterday. I have my DTD2 to finish up. Um, tonight is my 15th pr day protocal. Ooh, um, we, we're going to touch on that for a sec too. That's, that's a good one to touch on, okay? Well, yeah, I have my goals like two closings a month and I have not hit that for this month. I only have one closing. So now I have a call night tonight where I call for three hours tonight and then social media post and check out LinkedIn. Is that perfect? Perfect. That's a lot. No, that's okay. That's okay. So back to the 411, I'll touch on some of those topics you just about brought up, but you guys see on here, none of this stuff is really talking about how she's going to do it through expires and FISBOs, right? She, she has her budget. You can see she's going to be working on her touch plan, her clients, her sync. Those are her major things, right? And so if she would go to Rich's class, would she learn some things? Yeah. Would she grab a couple of nuggets that she may be even able to implement into her plan that might not be expired and withdrawn um, area? Yeah. But the reality is, is that just those little type of nuggets, those two hours that she would spend um, on something that she's not going to work on, she now can have, she now has the time, effort, and energy to go out and make her 50 sync, you know, calls. I, I love that. So not every class will be for you guys. Not every topic, not every lead generation source, not every style, um, not every, um, not every, not everything, but this 411 keeps you on track. 
Then it goes into your monthly goals, right? That's pretty easy. Now, awesome, Erica. All right, so Erica might do this a little differently than when, I, when I'm going to tell you, and that's okay because it's hers. But the idea around this, this is why the 411 kind of exists right here. Week one, let's pretend it's January 3rd or whenever we started this, this month on a Monday. January 3rd, she's going to fill out week one. Week two, three, and four would be blank. Okay, and they're blank for a reason. She's going to go through week one and she's going to try and tackle these, these, these items. 100 sync dials, um, two contacts. I don't know, actually know exactly what she means, but that's okay. It's for her. I'm going to go through this. Jason, why aren't you on this? <laughs> going to go through and uh, he's, she's going to work on these, these major rocks. These are her major rocks in the, her week. She's going to have days where there's so many other things going on. That's perfectly fine. But these are her major rocks. What she'll do is she'll go through and she'll she'll go through this week and then uh, the following week she's going to look at week two and she's going to set those goals. But she's going to look back here and if she maybe made let's say she made eighty sync dials, her weekly goal is a hundred. So that means on week two she would change a hundred to a hundred and twenty. Two letters to the DTD two. Let's say, let's go the opposite direction. Let's say she got four in last week. Now she has a choice. Do I do two this week or do I eliminate that and spend some time with my family? Number three, 15 contacts into command. Crap, she, she sucked. She only got five, right? She only got five in the first week. So in the second week, she's going to put in what? 25. So you see how your, 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 your monthly goal never changes, which means your weekly activities should never really change, but they may depending upon your efforts from week to week. Does everybody understand that? Let me go through one other scenario. Let's say that she just fills this all out like this and she hits 90 contacts this week, 80 contacts this week, 90 contacts this week, and 80 contacts this week. She's at a deficit of what? 90 contacts. Well, if, if in one week she wants to do 100, but after a month she's at a deficit of 90, she almost has cheated her. In, in one month, she's almost cheated herself out of one whole week. Does that make sense? And so if you constantly cheat yourself out of those types of things, but what happens is, is about midway through the year, you start to look at it and go, why am I not hitting my goals? I'm doing my activities. I'm setting forth these action items. It's because she's not playing catch up. And, and a, we, a lot of us do that. So I love this, Erica. Great job. Why is it called the 411? Four weeks to each month, four to one, for each month to hit your one annual goal is the idea behind a 411. I basically call it a 411 your weekly action item set list, which is, which is this guy here. You guys see how this develops and it evolves over time for Erica? This isn't part of a 411. She's added that in there to keep herself on track. Putting all of this stuff up here isn't necessarily part of a 411. She does it so that way she has everything she needs to see in one little area. So she's more likely to look at it, more likely to do it, more likely to accomplish it. I appreciate you letting me use that, Erica. Uh, a couple chats here. How do you decide which classes or how many classes you should attend? Has to fit in your overall plan if you don't plan on doing expired quiz work. Then you should take it. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly what Chad said, right? How do you figure it out? You, you figure it out by setting your plan and sticking to it. Um, here's my biggest example. It's 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 kind of a funny example, if you will, um, but it's 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 so true. We do it in real estate. But when I give you this example, you're going to laugh. So why aren't we laughing at ourselves when we do this? So let's pretend that you open up a restaurant. And, uh, you know, your plan is to have basically a, an American bar and grill. Wings, burgers, fries, uh, salads, just very Americanized, right? But um, you're, you're, you're a restaurant owner. You go to a convention 
for restaurant owners. Uh, vendors are there talking about their new fryers and this and that and all these different accounting systems that you can use to track the sales and this sort of things. There's vendors there that are, that are talking about, you know, um, selling you food at a, you know, at a discount if you buy this. Anyways, a restaurant seminar. You got the picture? You're at that restaurant seminar and you attend a, a, a speaking or a, a, a training or something around why Mexican food has a higher margin per dish to sell. And it makes you start to think, man, I might need to, I might need to incorporate some Mexican food into my restaurant so I can make a higher margin. If that bar and grill isn't off the ground and launched and successful selling burgers, fries, and wings, how hard is it going to be to implement or even just change to go to Mexican dishes? You see, that concept for us makes sense when we talk about that. But when we look at our business plan, we constantly are chasing shiny objects. We're constantly going to the Mexican food seminar and learning new things about Mexican food and then wanting to go ahead and put it into our restaurant menu. That only works with very, very, very few restaurants. And the few restaurants that can do it are what? They're well-established. They have a, a following. And that following doesn't necessarily care what they have on their menu because that following comes for the atmosphere, the restaurant, the, 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 the people, the personnel, the culture, right? But all of that stuff has to be built before you change. So that's kind of how you'll know. If it's not in your business plan, don't take the class. Because if it's not in your business plan, are you going to do it? Because if you not in your business plan and you're going to do it, that means you're not following your plan. I'm sure that. everyone's like super experienced and has their stuff going. I didn't at all last year and I really squirreled on everything. I would go to every training. I would be like, oh, that's such a good idea. I need to do a video on that. I need to be an expert on that. And then the next two, two days, there would be another training and I would jump to that. And I just kept spinning my wheels because I would get excited about it right at first. And then it would like filter off because it wasn't really in, in probably didn't bring, generate any additional business for me because I wasn't committed to it. Um, it but it, I, it, I spent a whole year doing it. So learn from me and just like kind of narrow your focus down, I guess is my kickback or take back from it. Yeah. You know, our, like it kind of also goes back to the, you know, the examples that we've learned in bold. Um, I say it on, a, on different training videos. You know, if, if you were to ask every person in your life to within, you know, 10 seconds to name five um, uh, internet search engines, people get really stumped after about three, especially when you put a time limit of 10 seconds on them. It, it's because our brain really likes to only hold so much of a capacity in one area or topic, right? If you are constantly looking at doing 17 sources of lead gen, you're not doing any of them methodically or, or um, purposefully, you're only going to see mediocre results, if that. And then you're not going to understand what's working and what's not. The only time to ever figure out what's working and what's not in real estate is to do it for 90 days. And I'm talking 100% consistently. What does 100% consistently mean? It means that if you're going to set your sights on, let's say circle prospecting, all right? Just an easy one for me to use an example of. If you're gonna set your sights on circle prospecting, then you're gonna to have to set your sights on a 90 day plan where you don't deviate because you cannot come to me and tell me open houses don't work after you've done three. You cannot come to me and tell me that cold calling does not work after you've done two hours of it, all right? It works, it all works. Michelle Harvey was on here, oh, uh, she's off now, but um, Michelle Harvey will tell you, she's, uh, she's, she ha she's told me multiple times, she learns slowly, but once she understands that she's got it. When that lady started cold calling the first time, it was difficult, but she kept going and today, she sounded like a complete natural born killer on scripts practice today. 
It takes her time to do it, but she set her sights on doing it and she's doing it methodically. So if I'm on a cold calling mission, I'm doing it for two hours a day, four to five days a week for 90 days before I decide whether it's not right or wrong for me. Got you. The other thing is, is in order to do it for 90 days, in order for to do it for two hours a day, you got to understand that those two hours are sacred. Meaning when you're cold calling, you can't grab a database member and then start to enter them into command, start to plug in all their information into your phone, start to send them a follow-up text or an email saying, thank you for your time. You see that five minutes that you just did that with that one person, cut your two hour time block down to an hour and 15 minutes or uh, uh, 115 minutes. Now, Go ahead and, and add 10 people to your database in two hours and take five minutes of time on each person. Did you lead generate for two hours or did you do data entry for 30 minutes and lead generate for an hour and a half? That's the other thing that trips us up. And that's what we're going to, that's a lot of what we're going to dive into today when we talk about building the business. I think a lot of, you know, I, I know I was in that for sure. We, we constantly, tell ourselves we're doing things but we really aren't necessarily doing the actions to build the business we're we're the the things that we think are necessary to do at that moment really should come later or the next day cool any questions so far great get back to my powerpoint here all right so um, every night session, we need to set those action items for the week. We need to go through, and what uh, Ignite calls it is our our four one one, or I'm sorry, our daily ten four, right? Ignite talks about a daily ten four. Ten four means add ten new contacts to your database, speak with ten people in your database, and write ten notes. This is what I'm supposed to uh, shove and hammer down your guys's throat. But just like we were talking about with your lead generation models and tactics, I'm not going to shove this down your throat. What I'm going to shove down your throat is you coming up and committing to your daily 10-4 or making your daily 10-4. So like I said, Derek's was 10 contacts a day with one database ad. So his daily 10-4 is a little different than, than this, but that's where he's starting. And that's where he's going to build off of that. And I encourage you guys to do the same thing. All right. All right, we are talking today about building the business, right? So night session one was all about what is the business? How do I wrap my head around it? Today, we're going to talk about building your business. And the only way to build your business effectively is through your database. And, and here's what I mean by effectively, okay? I watch people come in and out of this real estate game so much. I've kind of decided that you're going to fall on one side of the fence or the other. You're going to, you're going to be the person that is perfectly fine with calling the people that you know, love and trust and asking business from those people, or you're going to be the person that is really nervous around calling the people, you know, love and trust, but you're perfectly fine with talking to strangers or vice versa. Right. I personally have no problem talking to my database, my sphere of influence. I strangers were tough for me. Um, so no matter who you are, understand that the concept of, of real estate is building your database. And the number one reason why is because every, every other thing that's out there to do to lead generate could, is, is something that you can't control. And here's what I mean by that. If you build your business off of circle prospecting and cold calling uh, random neighborhoods, and um, the federal government comes out and says, you know what, we're going to add another layer of the do not call list. We're going to add another layer to the do not call list. And from now on, this activity cannot happen. Period. End of story. Doesn't even matter if somebody's on a do not call list or not. Nobody is to dial random numbers at random moments for solicitation. Your whole, th your whole plan is gone. I don't know about you, but open houses were my big thing for my secondary lead generation source. So my number one was my database, my sphere of influence. My number two was open houses and networking events. Well, like I said, I can control my database. 
I can't control the outside world. What happened with COVID? If I had a, if I had a plan in 2020 to crush open houses, I was derailed end of February, early March. My entire plan's gone. So any type of system or source that you guys can think about could go away tomorrow. That's the scary part about cold lead gen. But I'll tell you, your database, no one can take that from you. I really want that to sink in for a second. We gotta focus on that database. You gotta focus on your touch programs. Watch the sphere of influence video that I have. Just go ask people where most of their business comes from. If you see an agent that you think is highly successful, go ask them where their business comes from. Guaranteed fact, it's over 60 to 70% of all of their business comes from their database, people they know, love, and trust. Mine runs, mine ran at about 82 to 87% of my closed business every single year was from my sphere of influence. Mark Solomon ran at 92%. Damien Wise, I believe, well, he and I were pretty much on the same team. So he runs at about 87, 90%. Jenny Hart. Jenny Hart has a database called Facebook. That's her database. It's friends of her on her list. She may or may not have ever met them in person, but that's her database. I bet you she does close to 95 to 100% of closings through her database. So what is a database, right? What, do, what is a database and what's inside of it? All right, so I want you to just kind of, you know, close your eyes or just visualize this, stare into space, stare at the wall for a second. I want you to visualize a database as, as, this, as this huge bucket that you're holding. All right, it's this big, massive bucket. And with inside of that bucket, you're going to have different buckets. So literally think of like a five-gallon bucket, enlarge it times 10, and then put five-gallon buckets inside of that enlarged bucket. The big, large times 10 bucket is your entire database. And then each five-gallon bucket inside of there is your different silos of the database. So one of the biggest buckets inside of your database bucket is your sphere of influence. Then another bucket could be your vendors. Another bucket could be um, leads, leads that aren't part of your sphere of influence. What's another bucket you might have, Erica? Um, a bucket, um, my okay. husband's work. Perfect, right? Erica doesn't know him. She probably wouldn't call him sphere of influence, but it's people that she can get contact information for. Uh, one of my buckets is uh, real estate agents across the United States when I add people to my referral program. So your database, when we say the word database, I want you to think of that, just every single person. And the larger you build that database, the more opportunity you have, right? It's the law of the numbers. That's why buyers are so frustrated right now, right? They can only go out and see about two different homes. Well, they're only going to buy one home but they're frustrated they can't see 10. It's, it's simply because the numbers say, if there's more inventory, I'd find, what I, I'd find a better house for myself. Well, the bigger your bucket, the bigger your database, the more business you're gonna find for yourself. So we're gonna talk about database quite often today. We're also gonna talk about how to, um, how to effectively work it, how to effectively grow it, and some different tricks, tips, and scripts around it. Here you go, maximize your database. In order to maximize your database, you need to understand that your database, uh, every person in your database is a different person, right? So everybody has a different mindset, belief, idea, ideology, all right? And so that mindset and that ideology causes people to want to retain information in different ways. Meaning some of your folks are going to read and look at every single email that you send. Some of your folks are going to see the email that you send, see your name as the sender and read the subject line. Some of your people are not even going to be aware that you sent them an email. Okay, Amy's laughing. 
So just in one medium, you got almost, you can lump three different types of people in that one medium. You're going to also have people that will never call you back, that will never answer your phone call. And you're going to have people that answer your phone call every time. You're going to have people that never answer your phone call, but shoot you a text back right away and tell you, tell you that they're busy, even if they're not. Um, you're going to have people that never save you, save your name and phone number in their phone. And it's always going to sound like they don't know you when they answer the phone. Um, you're going to have people that every time you call, you're going to, you're going to wince at their name because you're afraid they're going to have another 20 minute conversation with you and you can't get off the phone. You're going to have people that receive your mailer and open it every time and put it on the fridge like you're their five-year-old kid that just drew their picture. You're going to have people that open up your mail, look at your branding, and throw it in the trash. You're going to have people that open up your mail and don't look at your branding, don't know who you are, don't remember who you are, and throw it in the trash. So I'm beating this like a dead horse because... I'm watching a lot of your guys' database uh, health scores in command, and they're not healthy. The, healthy the, the healthier they are, the more ways that you can interrupt their brain and understand that, that the more ways that you touch your database, the more effective you're going to be. Because the person that just throws away all mailers might be the person that responds to a text. The person that um, looks at all of your mailers might not be the person that ever looks at your email, but you got to be touching everybody in your database. You got to do it in all different ways. And the only way to do that or maximize your database is to have all accurate information. So what do you do if you have a bunch of names, but no information? Let's talk about a couple of sources or a couple of sites that you can, that you can work through. Um, in order to uh, get some context information, some people go straight to social media, add them on social media accounts to see if you can find maybe a birth date in there. I would not trust birth dates in social media because very often people do not put in their actual birth date. Um, it's becoming a very big thing right now with Facebook that people change. Facebook put something out that says you can only change your, uh, you can only change your uh, birth date so many times before it will disallow you to um, because so many people are changing their actual birth dates because it's funny people want privacy whatever 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 you have it but if you get it off of Facebook it's still a great way to dial them or pick up the phone and say hey look I just wanted to verify a few things I know that you know social media always isn't always correct but I definitely don't want to send you a birthday card on the wrong month or date what is your birthday is it January 17th 1989 whatever that is. Does that make sense? What are some other sources? What, let's say you have a, let's say you're door knocking and you have a name and address, but you want to find a phone number. What are some sources out there? Cool. So the this one is book. one of, what's that? The phone book. Yeah, you can use the phone book for sure. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, uh, truepeoplesearch.com. Truepeoplesearch.com is a pretty, pretty powerful system. Now, when you type it in, you might find multiple phone numbers. So you're not necessarily going to know which one is which. So pick up the phone, call those numbers until you hit the right person. Um, this, is a, this is a free one. The other one is called, I think, Ben Verified. This one you pay for. and most of the things that you pay for will have more accurate information. Um, but this one has, this was pretty cool. You can do an email lookup, address lookup, different things like that. If you're on the Longmont Association of Realtors, there's Forewarn. Yeah, yep. You got a bookmark for it right here. Uh, Forewarn is an awesome tool. So let's say you get a, you know, oftentimes I'll get a, I'll get a phone call or a text message from somebody that I don't have plugged into my phone. And I will go to forewarn and type in their phone number and do a reverse poll. And I can basically find their, their name at least. Sometimes you can find an accurate address, uh, but forewarn is another great one. Um, that one is definitely something I have bookmarked on mine. Bruce, I have a question. Yeah. Have you ever used HomeSnap? Have I ever used HomeSnap? Um, yeah. 
I have the app downloaded to do like searches, but I've never mm -hmm. used it on that side of the interface, no. So if you actually, um, there, you have to kind of play with it a little bit, but it kind of tells you which homes are most likely to list um, or least likely to list. So it kind of gives you a scale, like how long they've been there and whether they are or not, there's a lot of them that says, like if you scroll down, it says contact the owner. I was like, oh, cool. So I clicked on it and there's their phone number right there. And I was like, hmm. That, Wait. I'm so glad you brought that up. So you're talking about <laughs> this app right here, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. If you go, like, if you even do searches, you can modify it. You can do filters, but it say click on any property and scroll down on the about the property and it'll say contact the owner. And I know, I don't know. I, I'm obviously a very new agent, so I've never really heard of all these other ones but I've had a couple people call or answer and you know me and cold calling so I'm like very <laughs> <laughs> um I don't know hesitant but there's a lot of them and if they're on the do not call list it actually says do not call so I'm like perfect <laughs> so it scrubs it for you Ooh, this is very interesting yeah. I'm glad you said yeah. this I just right. wanted to bring that up <laughs> No, that's what these are for. Interaction type of things. Um, everything that we talk about on here is going to help some other person. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it on yours where it says contact the owner. Well, it should just say. Well, well, here's the thing that I just started realizing. You're talking about going into the app and clicking on houses that aren't listed. You can yeah, you can click on yeah. like ones that are listed, ones that are recently sold, ones that are just like even ones that I'm like looking at. A house right next to it was listed, and I'm like, oh, why didn't I like call them if they were on the do not call list or something? But yeah, yeah you I can bet see you, every I, house. I almost imagine it's not going to populate the owner's information if the house is for sale. Well, one, because we're not allowed to call that person. But two, she, mm -hmm. I think Casey's talking about off market properties, maybe diving into this. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I'll take a look at it. I appreciate you bringing that up, especially on this training video. Um, yeah. No and if problem. it's a new source that we need to be pumping out there, we'll do that for sure. Yeah. Cool. So, so many different sites, so many different things that you guys can use to find contact information for people. So that should not be something that gets in your way. Um, I, I will tell you the best thing to do is get and find, um, uh, get and find somebody's phone number and make a phone call and ask them for their contact information. As scary as it seems or sounds, it's it's not that bad. And people people are a lot nicer in this world than I think we give them credit for. Yes. There. We go. Feeding your database, feeding your database. So we talk about this all the time on scripts, right? There's five things that we're looking for out of every single conversation. And the last thing that I'm looking for out of every conversation is probably one of the most important um, things that I look for. So if every conversation I have, they're either a buyer, a seller, an investor, or somebody who wants to get into real estate, that's fantastic. I might make some money that way. But the last thing that that person could be, if they don't want to do any of those four things, would be somebody that would maybe refer me business or entertain seeing all of my marketing materials, right? That would be me capturing them as a database ad. Somebody define to me, what is a database ad? Casey, we went over this yesterday, or Erica can go. Um. Well, their name and their phone number, if you're, if they give you the okay. I used to think a database ad had to include their email address as well. So it needed to be like their email and phone number, but um, really just their phone number is all you need. And it makes things a lot easier than being like, okay, what's your email? And they have to spell this long thing out. <laughs> then you, I just feel like, you know, so just their name, number, and phone number, I think is all you need, but email is obviously, um, Good. I think I would ask like how they prefer. I mean, I don't know. Be like, is a text or a phone call okay? Or do you prefer email? I don't know. I haven't done that, but I thought of 
No, and that's 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 okay. You're not wrong. Those are the pieces of information that you pretty much need for a database member. But a database person, you guys, is is simply put, it's somebody who you have contact information not, for. Oh, I know. I'm like it's somebody you have contact information for, and that person is open open to you being in touch with them. That is that's the simple most simplistic way of of, of wrapping your mind around is this person a database member or not, right? If you have contact information for them and you want to talk to them again and they clearly have no objection for you reaching out to them again, that's a database member, right? People want to do business with people they know, love, and trust. You get to know, love, and trust people over time through multiple interactions, and those people that you build those relationships with are people in your database. So that's why I said a, a database is a big, big, big bucket. So just because I'm cold calling and I have a great conversation with somebody on the phone and they are open and receptive to me calling them back or giving them an email or whatever the case may be, does not mean that they automatically go in Bruce's sphere of influence bucket. The, the, the little buckets inside of the big one, they don't automatically go in my sphere of influence bucket. They may go into my, let's call it my nurture bucket, right? You guys can, you guys can have so many different buckets with inside of your database. It's up to you. As you grow your business, there'll be more and more buckets that you create. So for me, what I did was I went through and, and I ended up eliminating my, 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 um, my cold call or my, my open house or my, my database bucket where I, they're not people I know, love, and trust yet, but I don't necessarily want to deem them my sphere of influence. I don't want to, I don't want to spend a bunch of money on them yet. So I used to put them in a separate bucket. I would tag them as um, cold prospecting, I think is what I labeled it as. I knew if I clicked that tab or that tag, I could get a list of people that I need to build relationships with. Over time, I quit call. I quit. I quit calling it the cold prospecting bucket or whatever the heck I called it. I ended up adding another layer to my database or my. I'm sorry, my sphere of influence. So my sphere of influence consisted of people that I know, love, and trust that I categorized as A, B, and C. That's when I developed a D list. The people that I would cold call, have a great conversation with, they're not a lead. They're open to receiving my information, but I don't know them from anybody. I just happen to randomly call them. I've never met them in person. I just tag them as a sphere of influence category D. And as I worked to them over time through the touch programs and quarterly calls, and maybe they would give me a referral, then bam, I put them into the C category. And then over time, we went out for coffee. I actually met them in person. They're great people. They're, 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 they're absolutely going to refer me business. Bam, slide them over to the B category. If you guys aren't understanding what I'm talking about with the A, B, and C, as far as sphere of influence goes, watch the sphere of influence video for sure. Uh, we dive into that pretty deep. But you have to be feeding your database. If you're not feeding your database, right, your, your, your pool to your pool of potential people that refer you leads, if that grows, the potential of you, your business growing is, is exponential, which is why it has to be done. You have to grow your database. When you grow your database, the only way I know how to grow your database is to talk to people. And so that's why you'll constantly hear, hear me say, real estate is no different than a seller's house not selling. The number one thing that causes a home not to sell is the price is too high for what it, it, it what for what it is, right? That's the only thing. You can take a property. I'll put it this way: we just had an an extraordinary event happen in Louisville and Superior. Homes have burnt to the ground. Could they still sell those plots of land? Absolutely, right? One hundred percent. That dirt is still worth something. So. A seller never a seller doesn't sell if the price for what they're selling it for is not what the consumer feels it's worth. It's the clear-cut definition. So same thing as real in real estate. The only reason why 
people don't get business is because they're not talking and contacting enough people. The more contacts you make, the more people you talk to, the more people you'll run into who will be potential database members. And the larger you grow your database and work with them and nurture them, the larger population you have of leads coming to you, which means your, your, your percent chance of getting leads from your database is even greater, right? How do you feed your database? Watch the Sphere of Influence Touch program. That touch program will talk to you about ways to talk to your database that aren't always real estate driven. They get personable, um, they get generic, and they also, some of it is real estate driven. Oh, great. We just kind of talked about classifying your database. Classify your contacts, right? So I guess I will go through it a little bit. My sphere of influence, when I was in the heat of selling real estate, I had, I think, four or five categories. I had my A+, plus, my A, B, C, and D groups. My A+, plus were people I know, loved, and trust that referred me business or did business with me that year. So your a, my A+, plus category never really became massive. Just because you did a deal with me that year does not mean you're going to be on my A+, plus group the following year. To stay on my A+, plus group, you have to do business with me. You have to basically be one of my good friends, meaning I go to your house, you go to my house, we support each other's families, that sort of thing. Or in order to get into the A-plus category, you have to refer me closed business. So that A-plus category is the people that I spend the most amount of money on because they bring me the most amount of money. Um, your A-plus category could be things that you do um, you know, for, okay, so for instance, we got Valentine's Day coming up. Maybe everybody in my A plus category, they all receive a free dozen rose, uh, free uh, dozen roses if they want, right? I'll have them sign up for it or whatever. And then maybe my A, B, and C category, maybe then I do a contest where I give away five dozen roses and five bottles of wine. And then maybe my D category, I send out and I, I just give away one dozen roses. So you see your, your database is something that you gotta, you gotta be methodical with. You don't wanna spend a bunch of money on people that don't respect you, that will never refer you business and that never answer the phone. You literally can have somebody go from A plus to D quickly, right? I've had people that bought a property with me, put them in my A-plus program, smoothed them throughout the year, and then, bam, they're posting online that, they're, that, they're, that their mother just uh, bought a million-dollar property. And I call and I get the, the information from them. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, we referred them to our friend. Like, we use you, Bruce, but, like, we feel bad because we have another friend who's another real estate agent. Well, right there, they're telling, they're telling you that if they're not doing business in real estate, they're, you're not getting their referrals. So they got to come out of that A-plus category because the time, effort, and energy spent on them is not worth it. They just literally gave $30,000 to some other agent. So that means you don't need to give them a dozen roses. So classify your database, but also understand that, 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 that those classifications do not stay. People's lives change. You change. Um, those types of things. Some people might be your A group or your A plus group, and they be, and it's because of the proximity. They live close to you. It's easy to get the families together. They they come to all of your events because they're right there. And then bam, you sell their house. They move down to Castle Rock or or Colorado Springs, and now they basically answer your phone call every now and then. But you never see them, hear from them. None of the things. Your families can't get together. It's too far of a drive. They're not necessarily in your A+. Plus. So your database is living and breathing and classifying them will help you understand where to put your effort and where efforts do. Any questions on classifying? Cool. So we keep talking about this touch program, right? Like I keep saying touches. You got to touch your database. You got to do this. You don't want to physically go out and touch them. That is called harassment. 
um, you do want to make sure that you stay top of mind to them, right? And we talked about it at the beginning of the class. We talked about people having different takes on how they receive information. And so in order for you to stay top of mind for, to them, you need to understand what mediums that person really uh, uh, likes. So let me give you an example. My touch program is 42, is a 42 touch system. In that system, in any system, for anybody on this call, at a very base minimum, your touch program in my world has to be at least seven. If you do not have a seven step, or not a seven step, but if you don't have a seven touch system at, a, at the absolute minimum, you're not gonna get much of my time when it comes to talking about how your database isn't working for you. Those seven touches are the most important touches. They're the ones that make me the most amount of money. And they're the ones that I do, that I have to do no matter what time of limited time I have. All of the other touches in my 42 touch system can go completely to the wayside as long as I do these seven. So it's four quarterly calls, two handwritten notes, and one birthday something. Now, the reason why I'm talking about staying top of mind to people is because you will have people in your database where it, your, that, your command system will say, I need to call Eric Wolf. But in my notes, it says, Eric never answers the phone. He's always at work. When he's not at work, he's always busy with the kids. Never calls me back. But Eric texts me back every single time. So on his quarterly calls, I'm going to text him because that's how he wants to receive information. So have that stuff in your notes. Just because the task says call Eric does not mean I have to call Eric. I need to use my intuition, my business sense to understand that he needs to be, in order for me to stay top of mind to him, I need to use, uh, I need to touch him in a manner in which works for him. So I just said, those are the top seven things that have to be done no matter what. So that means the other 35 things that I do, I'm not necessarily going to be super intuitive about. Here's what I mean. Let's say I'm going to use Eric as an example again. Let's say Eric, I have it in his notes, like Eric never responds to emails. Doesn't mean I'm going to take him off the emails though, right? It's the, it's the handwritten notes, the cold or the phone calls and the birthday gift or card or whatever you do for birthdays. Those are the most important things. Those are the ones that I will deviate around in order for me to hit Eric the best, if that makes sense. Just because he doesn't open emails doesn't mean he's not going to get them because it's super easy. It doesn't take me any time. It's going to be blasted to everybody. Make sense? I have a question, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. So I'm, I'm just wondering, it's probably a dumb question, but um, and I'm so you say these handwritten notes and for our database, how, so I have no family really that lives here. And a lot of my friends, they live, you know, kind of close by or they live in Denver or out. So I would need their actual address. So do you just ask them for like their mailing address and like, Hey, I just want to send you a note or something. I feel like people are more hesitant to even give you your, their address. Like, how do I get them the note? I know that's answered. <laughs> you just ask. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, I, I had the same so I had the same thoughts, Casey. I had the same okay. limited mindset, same limiting beliefs. Who's gonna give me yeah. their address? Um the the nice part about real estate is we have all these tools to kind of get close to their address. So mm -hmm. what I would be doing is I I would look them up on public records or something and say, Hey, look, I am sending out XYZ to my entire database. And um, I noticed that when I came to you, know, you, I didn't necessarily know if I had the correct address for you. This is what I found. Is this correct? Okay. People say, and, and if people say what? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's my address. Go ahead. Um, you know, um, or some people say, no, nah, like, uh, appreciate you giving me a call. And that is my correct address, but um, I don't really want you sending me anything. Okay. okay. Hey, no problem. How do you like to receive information? Oh, you can just shoot me a text or send me an email. No problem. C, right? They're in my C <laughs> category at that point. 
I um, have a question that might be considered dumb also. <laughs> none of it's um, dumb. You guys haven't done this. It can't be dumb. Okay. So my question is on the emails that how do we decide what we put in an email? What is a, what's good to put it in? Where do we find it? That kind of thing. Yep. Because the top seven things that we talked about are the most important, your emails don't really matter. <laughs> it's just for branding. So what I'm getting at, Carla, is um, what do I put in my email? I put anything in my email that doesn't take me more than five or 10 minutes to do. Okay. So in my touch program, every single month, I would do a recipe of the month. Oh. Okay. And here's, and here's exactly how I do it. So this is a great example for this video. So like I said, five to 10 minutes, just go into Google. This is awesome. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I overthink. It, it, we all do, right? We all want our emails to be profound and, and be that, that capture that says, pick up that phone. I need to call Carla and I do business with her. There's only 2% of the population ever doing real estate at any given time which means we can't, we can't take time to tailor every single email to everybody. Um, so it's, it's simple things. Seasonal recipes for this time. And then um, what I like to kind of do is I go down here and maybe jump into page number two or, or something like that. Um, there's July, monthly seasonal. You just kind of go, ah, here's one just for all sorts, right? Here's, here's January. I usually try and find something I like. I don't care for beets too much. I love broccoli. So you, you really, and, and you don't spend a bunch of time on it. You just, I mean, I kind of like the way this visually looks. So now what I would do is maybe uh, copy this photo, start to, um, you know, see if I can find the recipe real quick. Oh, here it is. See if you can find the recipe, copy and paste it, copy and paste your source, and then put okay, it. Okay, the source. Email. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, I'm a copy and paster. I, I, I definitely plagiarize, if you will, but I just, I just cite my source. Nice. Um, but here's the key. That, that email is so simple, so simplistic, and then I just blast it out to everybody on command. The reason why that works, Carla, is because my email signature, it doesn't say it anymore. But you guys have seen my email signature. My email is fail often and fail forward right now. When I was at the height of my career, it said, you're real. That's the branding. That's why the recipe of the month works. It's not the recipe that gets me business. It's not them opening it that gets me business. It's them seeing my name and then I'm in real estate. Okay. Cool. That's really helpful. Thank you. Oh, yeah. No, great questions. Great questions. All right. So trying to figure out what campaign is best. I, I, will, I will tell you that it's been statistically proven that you need to have 33 or more touches. So when I first started in real estate, Gary Keller was definitely on the 33 touch system. Then as time goes, he says, look, I'm going to I'm going to keep my standard for you guys at 33 touches. But I, I think you guys need to start looking at some sort of 50 touch program because all of the number one brands that are in our heads at any given moment, remember how at the beginning of the class we said, hey, just challenge people in your life to name five different, um, you know, five different um, internet search engines. It's hard for people to think of more than two or three things on any one given thing. And so by branding yourself that many times causes you to be the number one or number two agent in that person's mind, right? Google, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Lay's, Nike, all of those like brands that are either number one in people's minds or number one on the, the ledger at the end of the quarter, they, they touch us more than 50 times a year. But if you were to ask how often you seen something with McDonald's, you may only guess eh, a handful of times. I see, I see it a lot, but it's only a handful of times. 
But if somebody were to tell you that you actually think about McDonald's more than 50 times a year, you kind of you kind of be like, what? Wait, what? Well, you drive past the Golden Arches, right? You read the newspaper and you see the two for five special. You're watching TV and you see the, the juicy Big Mac sitting there, or the quarter pounder, right? Whether or not you eat McDonald's or not, you don't call their service department and say, hey, you guys have been touching me a lot this year. Like, can we slow it down a bit? One, they're not going to do that. Two, there's no customer service line for that. But three, you're never going to do that because they touch you in a manner in which is okay to your brain. That's what we need to do in real estate. And that's why most of my marketing stuff has nothing to do with real estate, nothing to do with it. Now, the seven different things that I said here, four of which have real estate. I will talk about real estate on my phone calls with them. And sometimes I won't, right? In January, I'm not talking about real estate at all. Do you know why? Because January, so first part of January, I try and go get all of the Denver stats for 2021. I find things that I, I like that are profound, right? I don't need to over inundate my database with a bunch of statistics that they don't know how to read. I want to, you know, I want to, I want to find just those like three or four statistics that say we sold this many houses last year over this year. We did this equity went up by this, whatever those bullet points are for you. And then blast it out to your, to your, um, to your database. So now when I'm making my quarterly calls, if my database received that email, they're going to bring it up to me. I don't really have to bring up real estate. They'll bring it up to me. Um, maybe in J July, August, September, I'm probably going to bring up real estate because I need to build up my business for the winter. But my recipes have nothing to do with real estate except for my signature. Um, and, you know, so I, I think if you do, I do a 42 touch system and in my 42 touch system, there might be only five or six things that ever have to do with real estate. Everything is branded real estate, but it doesn't have to do with it. She had said something in here. My monthly newsletter is always uh, themed to a movie. Yeah, that's that's awesome, Chad. Roll with Spider, roll with Spider Man, roll with Superman, and roll with that theme. Create that. Um, the better you can do that. I mean, look at Eric Wolf's. I see that damn wolf everywhere I go. You know why? Because I got a sticker on my fridge from when he gave one to my daughter. Like that's branding at its at its most uh, highest and best use. But does that wolf have anything to do with real estate? Now, if I if if Eric does the, the right job, he's going to make his database correlate that wolf with real estate. All right, putting it all together. Here's your here's your action item for me. Got to watch that Spear of Influence video and you guys got to get a, a touch program set in place. You want to have your database so dialed in that you know exactly what kind of closings you're going to have off of your database if you follow your touch program. The only way to understand what kind of closings you're going to get off of your database is to start working the touch system and then tracking what your metrics are. So we start off in real estate and I, and I teach you guys, one out of every hundred contacts that you make will turn into a lead. One out of every 10 of those leads will close. So that's how you unfortunately start in real estate. And the reason why that's unfortunate is because that's a lot of people to talk to for one lead. So. What I'm basically saying is you better talk to a thousand people before you expect your first closing. That's a, that's a hell of a pill to swallow. Now, here's where it gets easier. That's when you first start. If you start by talking to your database and build the smart plans and systems, you start off at a one out of a hundred, but in six months, in three months, you can bust that sucker down to one out of 50 quickly. And that's through this branding. That's through building your business. The more people you put into your pool, the more likelihood you have of people that can refer you business. 
the more you're touching those people in your database, the more likelihood you're going to return business, right? The more that you understand the delicate psychological piece of branding and marketing that our brains use, the more you're going to receive business, right? And what I mean by the psychological piece is it's not 42 times a year you're bombarding them with real estate. It's personal stuff, life stuff, event stuff, then a little bit of real estate. But if you do this methodically and you set these things in place, you can instantly go from one out of 100 to one out of 50. So if one out of 50 causes you to have one lead per 50, then you only need to talk to 500 people for the next deal, right? And so if you talk to 500 people and you talk to 125 people a week, you should have a, basically a closing within your first two months. The key is, is that it's very, very difficult to get to the place where you can talk to 125 people a week. So better than try to figure out how to talk to 125 people a week, Take some time, make these, make these touch programs, set yourself up for success, and then start to will your way down from one out of 100 to one out of 50. And then it's, it says, basically, if you just follow those seven things that I talked about for one year and you have a database, you're, gonna, you're gonna basically going to be at a one out of 35 ratio. The more you do this and the more you brand it, that's when you get down to the successful piece. I can talk to about 17 people to get almost a closing anymore. It's not even like one out of 17 is a lead and then 10 leads to a closing. Um, your numbers get very, very easy the more you do it. The key is, is putting up that heavy lifting up front. And nobody wants to do it, trust me. Putting in my 42 touch smart plan system, I gave up. I beat my head on the table and I ended up paying my assistant to do it for me. Um, the command is the fourth CRM that I've used and have had to recreate a touch system. It's just the law of the beast, but I know it's necessary. So you are using command successfully now. When you say I am, see, Ever since Command came out, I was a, I'm, I'm a coach. So am I using it? Yeah. But I have people that run my 42 Touch program for me. So it's only, not necessarily through Command. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but yours should be because it's right there. Until you make a lot of money, Carla, don't pay for assistance. Don't pay for people to do stuff for you. You have the time to do it. I just, I, I want to I wanna coach at a high level. And I also need to sell some real estate. So I just don't have time for it. But I do have time for my quarterly calls. Like that is my number one thing I will never, ever stop doing. And one thing I just want to add to that, Carla, if you have the app of um, the command app, like it's kind of a new thing that I don't know if Ryan, you went to like one of Ryan's little meetings, but it makes keeping in contact with your database and just everyone so much easier. It's laid out a lot. It's I know, even on my computer, I can't even read it that well. Like I have all this stuff I have to scroll to and find it, but on the app, it just, it literally says your tasks, you know, things that are past due, things that are upcoming. And you can add a person, right? Like if you meet them in the grocery store, you can add them right to your database, like on your phone. So for me, that's been easy instead of having to, you know, write it down and then go home and add it. I don't know. Yep. So. Nice. Okay. Thank you. That's great, Casey. You're getting your system down, right? That's, we're all going to have to have that, right? It's yeah. awesome. So I know we hit hard on database. Like I said, there's a whole separate class on sphere of influence, but I will take a couple of minutes to stick around and, and answer some questions about touch programs. It's, it's something you have to do. And yeah, Ryan's a whiz at figuring out how to, how to get that going for you. Cool. Well, if there's nothing else, Ignite session three next week, I think, um, what is that one called? Let me see. Uh, session three is find the business. So we're talking about building the business, um, find the business.
that's going to be more of a lead generation based uh, class talking about different styles and techniques around it uh, to find the business. Um, we will probably spend a few minutes diving into how I more like more practical application, like role play with my database, how I get my database to brand, how I branded my database to get to a place where I could get I wanted to get to one out of 13. That was my goal. One out of every 13 contacts in my database, I wanted to lead. Throughout the height of my career is one out of 17 is kind of where, the, where I left off. Um, you can do it quickly and you can do it methodically and you can have business up and running like so it's so fast, it's unreal. But the key is, is how you, how you do it. So if you guys want, I've spent a few minutes with you because I, I think that a lot of you guys on here are still probably making your first couple of contacts to your database and are there are some people in your phones that you're a little nervous about contacting, right? I'm telling you that every time you're nervous, pick out why you're nervous and attack that. Most people are nervous to call their database because they don't want to sound like they're selling to their friends. Can anybody, can anybody relate to that? Okay. Okay. So for everything that you guys are fearful around, bring it to me, bring it to Harry, bring it to Lori. You got to attack whatever you're fearful around. So if I'm afraid to talk to my database because I don't want to sound salesy, then that's what I'm going to attack. So that would go along, that would go something similar to ring, ring. Hey, Carla, this is Bruce. Hey, I got to be completely honest with you. I just made a career change and it was pretty nerve wracking to pick up the phone and call you. And I don't know why it's simply because I know we're friends and I need to let everybody know in my life that I'm in real estate, but I also don't want to be that friend that, that you feel is just asking you for business in a sales format. So I don't know where I'm at, but here I am. I dialed your number. How are you, Carla? That's it. That's it. As simple as that, you guys attack that. Carla, how'd that make you feel on the other end? Uh, like I want to help you. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You're being supportive you, at least, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. The key is, is no one's ever going to call you a sleazy salesman if you call yourself a sleazy salesman. You know what I mean? If, if somebody, you know, anybody has that, that, that drunk uncle at family reunions, that's the clown. But just he openly admits that he's the drunk uncle and the clown. He's just there. You just kind of deal with it, right? But if he doesn't admit it and always denies, on, I'm not a drunk. My life is in order, la, 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 la. Then your family and you are probably going to talk about him behind his back. But if he owns it, you got nothing to talk about. So just own it. Every fear that you have in this industry, own it. Cold calling. I wish I, I wish somebody would have given me that advice when I was cold calling. Just practice on people. Hey, um, so just started a career in real estate. I'm calling around a new listing that I have. This is the first time I've ever done this. So I appreciate you answering the phone. And I want to ask you if um, you know of anybody looking to buy a house. I'm telling you, people on the other end that are strangers, they won't care. Especially if you tell them that you're nervous and why you're nervous. Everything that you do. When I first called my database, I was told to tell them that I would be contacting them on a frequent basis. I didn't, I didn't tell them that. And then the second time I called them, I kept getting, wow, you're really going to be talking to me a lot now, aren't you? Because you're in real estate, I think is what you said last time. I was a nerve wracking conversation. So I just hit the head on, I just hit it. Yeah, I'm, I am going to be calling you, you know, frequently throughout the year. The reason why I'm going to be calling you is because I want to make sure that I stay top of mind. I'm not really here to bombard you and pressure you into selling your house. I just simply want to be a friend and a resource for you. And the only way I know how to do that is to stay top of mind. So as I stay top of mind, I'm going to be reaching out to you to see if you have any real estate needs. And you're, my, my database loves it. They, none of them had a hard time with it as long as I told them why. The, my database did not care for it when I didn't tell them why because I went from not talking to some of these people 
but maybe once a year or maybe once over the last three years to calling them every quarter, it's, it's, our, it's, it's their right to know why we're doing that. So just tell them. Cool. Anything else before we end this recording? Great class, guys. Awesome. All right. Make it a great day. See you guys. Thank you so much.